Welcome everybody to Ebenezer this morning. Uh, as you kind of come in and find your seats, we're glad you're here. Uh, my name is Nick, one of the pastors. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. We're we're really glad you're here. Uh, we're really glad to see new faces. Uh, please get a, if you get a chance, come and meet me or one of the staff. We would love to get to know you better. Uh, I want to make a word of encouragement for those of you who began at the beginning of the year. Um, with the Bible reading, the chronological Bible reading, stick with it. We're going to get to the end. We're going to get it, all right? Uh, but don't give up yet. It's going to produce great benefits. Uh, if you're not attending uh, the early morning, the 9 a.m. Sunday school hour, please join us. Uh, we, we've got, uh, we're spread out a little more. The adults got a bigger space. We're, you're more than welcome. We would love to have you. The, the kids got some new stuff happening uh, up on the other end. Uh, and that's really exciting. So please feel free to join us for the Sunday School Hour. Uh, just a reminder, uh, there's a congregational meeting uh, after service today. You feel free to join us. Uh, it's not exclusive to just that, but you can see the church at work. Uh, on another note, in three weeks, and this is kind of important, it's food related, uh, in three weeks, we're going to be having lunch. It's kind of a chili cook-off type of thing. I don't know about you guys. I like that. Uh, but it's just going to be a potluck. Bring a hot and a cold as usual. Please plan on joining us. Now, I wanted to say one thing. Um, a, a number of people stay after. We have a nice lunch together. Uh, but we're, we've got a little thing going on in the family here. And what, a, what that ends up being is... We've got a very small amount of people they are doing a whole bunch of work to make sure that thing works out. So what we've got out in the front is a little sign-up that says, I would like to help with maybe the setup and the, the service at the beginning of that. Or I would like to help with maybe clean up afterwards, wipe some tables and like that. Or I'd like to help maybe just put chairs away. Please sign up so we have confidence that we're sharing the load with some of those who are carrying a bigger load. Okay? Just if you're going to enjoy the meal, uh, we invite you to help if you're able. Also, pay close attention, October 16th, we will be having baptism and we'll be affirming some new members. If you would like to participate in baptism or membership, we'll be having baptism and membership classes on both Saturday the 1st and Saturday the 8th of October. Just connect with me, the office or staff and join a class and we'll get you squared up for that. So with that, we're going to have one of our deacons, Jed, who's going to come and pray for us this morning. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. Lord, we look at the sunshine outside and we see the, uh, the crops starting to change for the fall. Lord, we know that you are control, in control of everything that you've created this world for us to enjoy. And we just thank you so much that you permit us to, to observe your handiwork. And Lord, again, just today is such a beautiful day outside. We thank you for that. Thank you that we're allowed to come here and worship, that we're not restricted in any way and that uh, we have freedom to worship here in, in this church and in our homes lord we're not um, not held back and not told what we can and cannot say and we're just thankful again for that lord we know that there are a lot of people in our congregation that have physical needs and that have spiritual needs and you know exactly what they are um, we don't have to enumerate each one you know who needs a spiritual touch who needs a physical touch who just needs some encouragement, and we pray that you will reach into their lives, Lord, and just uh, give them whatever it is that they need right now. We also have an up upcoming congregational meeting today, Lord, and I pray that you'll give us wisdom, give us a spirit of unity within the church. Uh, help us to know that this is your church, not our church. It's, it's where we worship, but Lord, this church belongs to you, and I just pray that you will give us wisdom and give us um, just a love for each other that you want us to have. And then I pray, Lord, for the people that are around us that need you. We all know people that have never accepted you as their Savior, that uh, need, need to hear about you, need to be told uh, why they need you, and, Lord, need to make a decision to, to allow you into their lives. And I just pray for those people. I pray that we can be the lights in their lives that they need, and our, our, um, our ability to, to tell them about you will be what you need or what you want uh, for them to hear. And so... Lord, just give us the spirit of really being concerned about people around us and wanting to see people brought to you. Thank you again, Lord, for just everything you provided for us. 
in our everyday lives and just give us the real desire to serve you that we need. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This morning we have some special guests, some missionaries of ours, um, and news to me because I'm kind of new around here, but Daniel Plett and his wife Kirsten are here this morning and they're going to share a little bit about their work. Uh, I th- and I believe, well, I think it's Trans World Radio, if I'm not mistaken. But I'm going to let them tell you. Uh, welcome them this morning. I'd like to first start with greetings to somebody else, though. I'd like to greet you from my mother. Some of you know her if you're old enough or have good memories. Annabelle Stover, then Annabelle Platt, and now Annabelle Rupp. So greetings. Also bringing greetings from Anna, my daughter, and my son Samuel, who are in college in different parts of the United States. Dara is with us this morning, and I'd like to introduce the newest member of our family, my wife, Dr. Kirsten Painter. We were married in June 24th. I'm going to... (laughs) That's what I think. (laughs) Actually, there's going to be a little less about me, a little less about TWR, because I'd like you to also hear some from a very important member of our team, and that's Kirsten. If you see the languages that are going to be up here on the picture, that's what I do. I work in all these different languages, but I don't speak all these different languages. I think if we added all the languages up here, we can't, but God still said we have an obligation to speak to these people and tell them good news. So three years support for me, started on Bonaire, then in Monaco, and now in Bratislava, Slovakia, and for your support of historically many other TWR missionaries, you're now speaking God's truth. You're speaking hope in all these languages. These are TWR languages that we're broadcasting around the world, and the ones in bold come through the center in Bratislava. Right now it's about 62. So thanks to God's gifting of technology, and teamwork, you're now speaking 62 languages. Hope, the people that need hope. We are active in our local church in music, leading small groups, sometimes speaking in Bratislava, but compared to probably most of the missionaries that you have here, that is a base for me ministering out. Sometimes it's very specific, with some partners in different languages, like this spring, very intense work with the Russian and the Ukrainian departments, and you can pray for them. The Ukrainian um, department now produces almost everything in-country, or getting material and finalizing it in-country instead of getting it from around the world because they're daily with their own people. And it doesn't mean it's easy. Almost all the programs are now produced in temporary studios. It might mean a bedroom or a kitchen, try to make it sound isolated with minimal equipment because most of the studios were damaged. Everybody, the men are not allowed to leave the country if you're, if you're under 60. You need to be protecting your country. So even the director of our Ukrainian ministry was drafted and digging ditches for a while, digging trenches. But he was ministering also to the people, the other soldiers listening to the programs. And as he was done with that, They went to one of the main seminaries in the Ukraine that's provided materials and people for them, but it was destroyed. And they took the TWR Ukrainian staff there to help them clean up so they could rebuild. These are hopefully situations that neither you or I have to live through. But your support for us is supporting them. So I want to say thank you this morning. We had asked at the high school and junior high this morning, what about refugees? Yes, in Slovakia we have about one refugee for every 21 people. So in the United States, it'd be roughly um, divide 360 million by 20. That's about how many refugees there are. And they're being helped greatly, providing housing, food, and jobs, and as it should be. So you can pray for that. Our church has had, for three or four years, the Ukrainian outreach in the afternoons, and they jumped from about 30 to 40 people to 150 to 250 people. So that's a great praise, but it's also a prayer request, and you can pray for that. And you can pray for the leaders of our Russian ministry. Many of them are in danger because they are speaking things that are not expected. So, and I will let Kirsten speak for herself because the man shouldn't do that. 
Good morning. Um, I guess I'll just give a little bit of an introduction to myself. Um, I grew up in a very small town of 1,200 people or less, um, kind of the town and surrounding areas in eastern Colorado, wheat farming and cattle ranching country. Um, I went to college at the University of Colorado and really had my salvation experience with the Lord there. Was called into medicine and was also called into a period of singleness. I didn't quite know what that meant, but God said it was going to be for a while. He didn't call me to be a nun, but he said, you're going to be single for a while, and I want you to be a physician. So I did that, and that was a very odd and strange thing for where I came from and for um, things that had been part of my life prior to that. But God opened doors, and I was able to go to medical school, and uh, God opened doors again, and I've been on the staff of Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona for 19 years. In the midst of the pandemic, I thought, you know what, I've been single, we can socially distance, I can socially distance, I've lived apart most of my life from close contact with a lot of people in my own personal living quarters. But about a year into it, God started to get a hold of my heart, and he started to give me a craving and a desire to have someone to finish life well with. And I didn't know how to go about that, but God did. And so in the midst of the pandemic, Daniel and I met. I was able, fortunately, to travel to Slovakia to spend some time with him in Slovakia. And God moved me, and God called me again. And he said, this is where you need to be, and this is who you need to be with. He gave me a friend that I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. I'm not sure what I'm going to do when I get to Slovakia. My resignation has been tendered. And my plan is to learn the language and learn my way around, learn how to function, and be of support to Daniel and his family. And with my skills, there's all sorts of things bubbling up in terms of what I may do. I may go into humanitarian work or volunteer work, certainly. Um, there may be opportunity for me to do medical work. And I also have credentials as a life coach, so I may be operating some sort of entrepreneurial life coach to Christian missions and missionaries through TWR or otherwise. So that's our sort of plans at this point. We leave in December, and um, so I'm getting ready to say my good goodbyes to my um, employer, my colleagues, my patients, um, my family, and getting ready to go. So we appreciate your prayers and support, and just know that we love that and, and want to love you in return. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. It's pretty awesome, isn't it, to see the gospel going out throughout the entire world, isn't it, church? All right, if you don't mind uh, standing with us, we're going to open worship today with uh, nothing but the blood.
来。
Again, welcome this morning. We're glad you're here. Um, before we jump to the text, let's just pray once more. Father, uh, I pray that the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts would be truly acceptable in your sight. You are our rock, our redeemer, and to you we look this day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, this morning we're going to take another uh, shot at Jeremiah. Uh, so if you have your Bible, and I trust that you do, um, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 20. That's where we're going to begin this morning. Jeremiah chapter 20. It's a little different uh, uh, flavor today. Uh, the uniqueness of uh, Jeremiah in, in, as a whole, hopefully you're reading it along with me somewhat. But here's one of the things I'd like to bring to bear um, we sing the song, uh, In Christ I Stand, you know, in Christ alone, we're going to stand in this. And, uh, and now sometimes I think we sing songs that uh, sound well and we mean well uh, until we're asked maybe to stand in an opportunity that is more difficult than we uh, first imagined it might be. And that's where Jeremiah is today. Uh, Jeremiah... Uh, gets to do something in his book that we don't see in a lot of the other prophets. Uh, he gets to really air uh, some of what he's feeling, the, the, the angst that he feels in the midst of the work that he had to do over a period of probably 40 years. Uh, and, uh, and there's a lot of pain he's living in. He's living in a lot of different types of situations that cause him a lot of pain. And I'm like, why would God allow... Uh, us to see the pain of the prophet. I mean, he could have just wrote, this is what the Lord said, and he said, judgments come in, uh, repent, and all the prophet-like things, right? But he does more than just the prophet-like things. He says, this is how I feel, and it's terrible. And he, start, and he's, and he really is he's unloading his heart, saying, this is what I'm feeling here. And I'm like, why is, this such, why is this such a big part of the book of Jeremiah? And I'm like, and I started digging in. It's like, you know, other books where the author really goes deep into the pain that they're experiencing. Um, I thought, well, Job is one of those, right? But Job's pain is different. Job's pain is born out of an, an incredible loss of family and uh, prestige and all of his, his belongings, the loss of his health. And, and that's agonizing to him. But Jeremiah is different. And so I was just reading and reading as I'm going to Jeremiah, and then suddenly it dawned on me. Anybody heard the term cancel culture? It's a rather, we think it's a rather new term, right? It's, I mean, and actually, it's a fairly new term in our vernacular. But the cancel culture, which is the idea of socially shaming someone into behaving either like you or just going away entirely, Right? That's what we do. It's a social bullying of sorts that allows people to say hateful things in a general direction. And the goal is to gather enough of that inertia that they'll just shut their mouths and leave us alone. Or they'll stop saying whatever we didn't like them to say. That's the cancel culture. Is it alive and well in America? Yeah, I'm seeing a collective head nod. Yes, indeed it is. But the, the cancel culture is not new. Jeremiah's pain, and the deeper I got into it, Jeremiah lived for 40 years as the recipient of attempt to be canceled by the culture around him. For 40 years, the people around him, his friends, his family, those around tried to cancel him, cancel it because they didn't like his message. Now, What's all the whining and crying about, right? Well, evidently, you've not been canceled, right, lately. What's it feel like when people say, and they come and try to socially bully you into submission? How does that feel? And as I was going through this, and I realized, and I, it, it popped up in a number of different passages, what it does is it creates an inordinate amount of shame, Social shame, even though it's not for anything that he had done that was wrong. Shame is one of the most powerful human emotions we can feel. In fact, it is it's so powerful, most people will reject shame and turn to anger, turn to despair, turn to depression. Because those are more manageable than shame. Shame is devastating to the soul. 
And that's what the prophet was talking about. He is, he is the, the recipient of shame over and over. And he don't know how to live in that. So as we're going through that, now, and a, for, just for the sake of uh, a context, uh, I didn't understand the nature of shame until recent years. And I might have told you the story, but I'll tell it again. Uh, but in, in my recent years, I was working in Milwaukee, uh, primarily with uh, uh, ex-cons. And in, during one of the times in one of our sessions, we were, we were talking about, and I was, just, I was talking about shame as this powerful emotion that can make us do stuff that we wouldn't normally do. It can make us cower in a hole somewhere. It can make us act out on somebody and lash out in anger, but it's mostly shame-driven. And I'm talking through this, and, and there's this large man from the central city of Milwaukee, quiet man, his first name was Abdullah. And he rarely spoke, and suddenly we're in the middle of this session, and this large man stands up and exclaims, I get it. That's what... He says, when I was six years old, my mother put me on the street because I looked like my father whom she hated. And so she drove me from the house at six years old. And I sold drugs to survive and surfed couches from the time I was six. But what I really didn't realize, and he's, this man's just like pouring his heart. What I really didn't realize was this. What was driving me was I was ashamed of myself. Something must have been broken with me or wrong with me that I was not acceptable or lovable. And I was ashamed of me because of what my mother did. So I grew large and strong and violent. And I lived in and out of prison for these last 20 years because of shame. Shame is a powerful powerful emotion and that's what the cancel culture is intending to do it's intending to shower social shame on you for having a thought that doesn't line up with somebody else's thought and if you receive that it'll affect you deeply and there's where the prophet is the prophet was pick it up in chapter 20 and we're going to get a series of situations we're going to hop around the book of jeremiah because i want you to see the heart of the prophet chapter 20 verse 1 now pashur the priest the son of immer who was the chief officer in the house of the lord heard jeremiah prophesying these things and if you'd back up the these things was babylon's going to come and they're going to they're just going to kick the daylights out of you judah because you're so wicked he's been prophesying that and when he hears him prophesying these things then pashur beat jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate of the house of the Lord. And he left him there. Next day, Pasher released Jeremiah from the stocks. So the well, first thing he do is he didn't like what he said. Because he was prophesying and saying something that he took him and he had him beaten. He could do that. He had the power. He was kind of like the, the police of the temple. So he had him beaten and then he had him locked in a public stocks for additional shaming. So he can be publicly shamed for this, for just for what he said. Because he said that, we're going to harm you. And then he released him. And Jeremiah turned and says to him, The Lord does not call your name Pashur, but terror on every side. Pashur, so I dig it up. What does Pashur mean? The, the name Pashur has the idea of, of liberation. Of the freedom. So I, you, you, you call yourself the freedom and liberation. He said, I'll tell you what your name is. Your name is terror on every side. Ooh, evidently shaming the prophet didn't quite get him there, did it? Because he comes back saying the word of the Lord. The Lord does not call your name. He's, he's talking the words of the Lord. Name, past sure, but terror on every side. For thus says the Lord, behold, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. And they shall fall by the sword of their enemies while you look on. And I will give all Judah to the hand of the king of Babylon. And he shall carry them captive to Babylon. He shall strike them down with the sword. Moreover, I will give all the wealth of the city and all of its gains, all its prized belongings, all the treasures of the king of Judah into the hands of their enemies who shall plunder them and seize them and carry them to Babylon. And you, Pasher, and all who dwell in your house shall go into captivity. To Babylon you shall go and there you shall die. And there you shall be buried. All 
you and all your friends whom you have prophesied falsely. God said, I ain't going to tolerate that. I ain't going to tolerate you coming after my man when he's trying to speak the truth that I'm trying to get. So he's prophesying directly against this king, using his word on play of words. But then you see a shift. Jeremiah is bold, and he's just saying the words of the Lord. You're going you're gonna to get it, man. You, you're going to get paid back for this giving me a beating, putting me in stocks. And then it's like he pulls away from that fray, pulls away from that intense conflict. And he's not unaffected. And quite frankly, it's the opposite. He's deeply affected by that. This is what he says. It's like he's getting time with the Lord. And he says, Lord, you've deceived me. And I was deceived. You're stronger than I and you prevailed. I've become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. You make me say this stuff. And then they go after me. And they all, they're all pouring this mockery on me. And, it, and what between the lines what it's saying is, it hurts to be mocked by people that I respect or that people respect. For whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become to me a reproach, a derision all day long. For the word of the Lord, I'm sorry, if I say I will not mention him or I will not speak in his name, there is in my heart as if it were a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary of holding it in and I cannot. It's like I don't want to talk about it anymore. He's like, I don't want to talk about you, Lord, because every time I do, they try to cancel me. They try, they try to harm me. They try to do this, but I can't not say it. I can't not be who you created me to be. And then notice how it, it plays out, this canceling. He says, for I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. You see, that's the problem, the problem in the interim of being a prophet. See, the prophet says, King, you're going to get it in the shins. Then the prophet goes home and waits and waits. And the king seems to be doing just fine. It's almost as if they've taken this piece of the passage and says, i become this laughing stop. Everyone mocks me because whenever I speak, all this goes on. And I hear people whispering, terror on every side. Yeah, right. You hear what he said? He said to the king, terror on every side. There's no terror. We're all good. What's his problem? Denounce him. Let us denounce him. Notice the, this corporate shaming. Let's gather together and make sure he knows how little he should feel for what he's saying against the people. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. Say all my close friends. Oh, this isn't just people on the internet who didn't like your post. These are his friends who didn't want to hear this. And they're looking for a way to cut him down too. They watch for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived and then we can overcome him. They will take our revenge on him. And then he says, but the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my per per persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly ashamed for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. And that's true. They're written down in the words, the permanent words here. O Lord of hosts who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for you have committed, for you, for to you I've committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of the evildoer. So he's going back to the prophets, prophecies when God says, I'm going to make you like a wall that they can't overcome. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to do that. So he's like, he's, so he's kind of up and then he's down and then he's like, oh yeah, praise the Lord because you're just, you're making me strong. And then he tumbles again. Up real high, then he's depressed. Listen to what he says. Cursed be the day that I was born. The day when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you, making him very glad. Let that man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning and alarm at noon. Because he did not kill me in the womb, so my mother would not 
So my mother would have been my grave and her womb would have forever great. Why did I come out of the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend all my days in shame? Shame is powerful. And shame is what keeps us from speaking the words of God to our neighbors and to our coworkers and to the people we run into. We don't want to be shamed. We don't want to be somehow, well, ooh, look at you, Christian person. So we just keep our mouth shut. The prophet couldn't keep his mouth shut. God had created something in him that wouldn't allow him to, to not speak. It had to come out. And every time it came out, he took it in his shins. And he's like, God, I just wish I was never born. This is so painful. I wish it would have never happened. This day would have never come. And he goes on, and we're going to see as we move through this, we're, we're going to jump over. You don't have to jump with me, but I'm, there's, a, there's a, a passage in chapter um, 7 just reiterating the rejection. And then it says, so you shall speak all these words to them. This is what the Lord is saying. But they won't listen to you. You shall call on them, but they're not going to answer you. God's saying, just get ready for rejection. You're going to say what I say, and they're going to say, no, 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 no. Have you lost your mind? No, no, you're wrong. Or in 17, they will not listen or incline their ear, but stiffen their neck, that they may not hear and receive instruction. God's just saying, they're going to reject you over and over. In chapter 11, this episode took place. The Lord made it known to me, and I knew. And, you sh and then you, meaning the Lord, showed me, Jeremiah, their deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to slaughter. I didn't know it was against me. They devised schemes saying, let us destroy the tree and its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. But, O Lord of hosts who judge righteously, who test the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for I... For to you I have committed my cause. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning, concerning the men of Anathoth. Now, if you remember the name Anathoth, that's from the very beginning in chapter 1. Jeremiah was a priest from Anathoth. That's his hometown. These were the leaders of his hometown. This is what the Lord said concerning the men from his hometown who seek your life. And say, do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, or you will die by our hand. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will punish them. The young men will die by the sword. The sons and their daughters shall die by famine. And none of them shall be left. For I will bring disaster upon the men of Anathoth in the year of their punishment. Hmm. Not only threats of canceling, threats of violence. Threats of death. Now, most of us live in pretty passive lives, and nobody's really coming after us in violence, I hope. But that changes things when you know that there are people out there looking to take your very life. I had a very interesting episode. Central City, Milwaukee, again, exposed me to a bunch of madness. Had a guy working for me, and he was a reformed, well, all kinds of stuff he was reformed from. But his big thing was gun running. He brought guns to the Milwaukee all the way up from the, from the Delta, Mississippi. He ran that whole circuit there. Deliver, his family delivered guns. And he had left that life a long time ago. But not his whole family. And so one of his family ended up getting into a different part of the business, which that happened to be drugs which drugs wasn't their thing. They were gun family, right? Long story short, a cousin of his did a bad drug deal with a really bad family in Chicago. And he lost all their money. And you know the stuff you see on TV? They don't like that very well. It's real. And 
the family put a list of ten names of his family members. And in three days, four of them from three different states mysteriously passed. Actually, not mysteriously at all. And he was on the list because he had been connected in the past. You want to see a big, strapping, gun toting kind of guy in terror? To know that you're on a hit list suddenly changed everything. I remember him going to the door, leaving for the end of the day, heading to his car, stopping at the door and saying, Nick, just hold on a second. I want you to step back. And he peeks out the door. You just stay here till I get in my car. And then he hustles across the street. I mean, this guy is a big, tough guy. Hustles across the street, jumps in his car, and roars off. And for a week, our whole company was on notice. Our whole ministry was on notice until they bought out the hit. The family paid them off a quarter of a million dollars. And they could now live in peace. All the prophet did was proclaim the word of the Lord, and he's being threatened for his life. I think we got it pretty easy, actually. But he's feeling it. He's feeling the death threats. He's feeling all of this stuff. Then it's even more. Listen to what happens. Chapter 16 says this. The word of the Lord came to me and he said. You shall not take a wife. You shall not have sons or daughters in this place. Oh. Wonderful story. God bringing people together together. There's support, there's comfort, there's a network that that holds you up when life is going crazy, when people are talking down to you, when you know when when you're being canceled, you can at least go and find somebody who's right really going, hey, it's all right, you know, they're just being knuckleheads. Don't worry about them. We got this, right? And God says, no, you don't get that. You don't get that support. You don't get to have children. You don't get that family home to come home to where you can find a place of solace. Your your little castle where you're. At peace. You don't get that. Because the children born in this place. Are going to die. They'll die of diseases. They shall not be lamented over. And they'll not be buried. They'll be as dung on the surface of the ground. And he goes on to say how horrible it's going to be. And then he says. Oh and by the way. I don't want you to go to any of the houses of mourning. Or to lament or grieve them. So you don't even get to go with people. Who are in the middle of their grief. Don't even go around them. Don't be there. Because they're going to die. And the Lord has cut himself off for that. Then in verse 8. He's like. "Um, Oh and by the way. Don't go into the house of feasting either. So don't go where (laughs) there's crying. And don't go where they're partying. Because the Lord spoke against them. You don't get a family. You don't get to go to your friend's funerals. You don't get to go to the parties that. I mean, he's like, you didn't get invited to any of the reindeer games. He's ostracized by the Lord to not engage other people like that, but just to speak. For I, thus says Lord, I will silence this place before your eyes. The voice of mirth and gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride will be silent. You get to live out The image of suffering before these people. And you were unhappy because not everybody liked your Facebook post. Boy, I hate when that happens, right? Chapter 15. Woe is me. My mother, you bore me a man of strife and contention to the whole land. That means everybody didn't like him. The whole, the whole nation was against him. He says, I haven't lent or borrowed money, yet all of them curse me. I guess when you borrow money from somebody, the implication is you don't pay it back. And everybody's like, yeah, that dude, he didn't pay me. His, you know, he still owes me uh, interest on his thing. He said, I didn't even do that. And they all curse me. I mean, I wasn't even a bad guy. And the Lord said, I, have I not set you free for their good? Have I not pleaded before the enemy in the time of trouble and, dis- and distress? Can, can one break iron and iron from the north and bronze? 
your wealth and your treasures I will give as spoil without price for all your sins throughout the territory. I will make you serve your enemies in a land you don't know. My anger is kindled and uh, shall burn forever. And then he says, Lord, you know and remember me. Visit me. Take vengeance on my persecutors. In your forbearance, do not take me away. You know that I, for your sake, bear reproach. Your words were found. I ate them. Your words became to me a joy and delight in my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, O God of hosts. He said, God, I believed it. I received it. You spoke to me and it was good. It's where I needed to be. It's where I want to be. And he says, I didn't sit in the company of revelers. I didn't rejoice. I sat alone. Because your hand was on me. It filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing? My wound incurable. Refusing to be healed. And then he takes a turn. A serious turn. And he accuses God in his depression, in his cancellation, in his isolation, in his loneliness, in his all of this. He takes a turn. And you can reach a point where anything's on the table. And he reaches it and he says to God, will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail? The image is a traveler going through the desert areas of the Middle East, right? And you're supposed to get to a certain part. And when you get there, you need to find water or else you're going to be dry, right? So there's not, and he says, are you going to be like when I showed up at this little place? There's supposed to be a creek here. I can fill my things. And, and, it, and it didn't produce. I'm empty. I'm in, a, I'm, I'm in trouble. God, are you going to be like that? Is that who you are to me? You're, gonna, you're just going to leave me hanging here? And he, and he really, in a sense, turns against God. He's like, God, I don't... Is this really my lot? Is this really where I have to live? In pain? What does God do when you get to the end of your rope and there's no more rope? And you start to wonder, is God really God? Is God really good? Does God really care about me? And you let go of the rope. He lets go. The pain was too much. The shame was too great. The prophet lets go. We lost faith. Before I take it to the next step, because you need to see God's response. The one thing that I notice about the prophet Jeremiah in all of his pain. Where does he address it? Where does he go with his pain? God, he's crying out to God. He's constantly crying to God with his pain. God, are you this deceitful brook? Is this who you are? He's constantly looking upward. And God, in his graciousness to his prophet, reaches down and says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, the word there is for the idea of repent, if you turn back, I'll restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them. And that was a prophecy in the end. When he gets ready in the end of Jeremiah, the people will eventually say, Oh, help us, help us, help us. And then he's going to say, too late. God said, no. And that's exactly what's going to happen. And then he says, I will make to you this people, to you to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you. They shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. It didn't mean that he wouldn't be canceled hated, attacked, shamed, mocked. It just meant that God wouldn't let him go. Come back to where I want you to be. Say what I need you to say, and I'm going to be with you. And he was. But it didn't alleviate the pain. 
And the question I come to at the end of this thing here is this. The question is, what about us? What has God asked of us? What is God expecting of us? And how do we relate similarly to that? This one you can turn to. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is speaking. Jesus is speaking. And he says, blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Oh. That sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Oh, this principle is transferable. <laughs> it goes to us as well. You're blessed when you stand in a position that is clear and concise enough that the world says, wait a second, that, that doesn't sit with me. You see, it's easy to kind of keep your head down and your mouth shut and cruise through life without that, right? You just don't say anything. You just stay silent. You don't have to worry about it. People won't say evil stuff about you. People won't deride you. People won't mock you. Just keep your head down. And he's saying, blessed are you when they do that for my sake. Rejoice and be glad because you're like the prophets. You're just like them. Your reward in heaven is great for doing the right stuff. There's reward for that. But if you roll over to Luke, there's just another little passage. You don't have to go there. But in Luke chapter 9, there's another statement made. There is reward for being rejected, suffering the pain, taking a position that may be canceled. But in Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9 says, that is not the right verse and chapter. Sorry, I don't have the right one in front of me. But it basically says, if you're ashamed of Christ and his words, he'll be ashamed of you. Well, that's pretty direct, isn't it? Isn't that what it is that drives us kind of ashamed to say what we need to say? And we kind of cower into a hole. And we wish we had said later, oh, I wish I just said it and then I can't get it back. And I find it ironic, and I'm going to poke you in the eye a little bit because I love you. We love our missionaries, and Ebenezer is good at missionary stuff. We raise a lot of money, we send missionaries all over the planet, and we expect our missionaries to shamelessly, unapologetically speak the truth in hard places. And pay the price for that service. Do we not? Do we want missionaries who will not shamelessly proclaim the truth? Oh my goodness, no. We would cut them, right? We don't tolerate that stuff. And then I'm asking myself, if we're so adamant about putting money out there so people will go out and share this message without shame, without apology... Certainly that must reflect how we operate, right? We shamelessly, unapologetically proclaim the goodness and the truth of God. Or do we? I told the story before, and this is to my discredit. But this is a horrible example, and I don't want you to miss. I worked a summer, I told you, I think I told you this. I worked a summer building mobile homes. Years ago while I was in college, and there's the one guy there at the mobile home factory that was just the rudest, most vulgar, hateful person I had ever spent time with. I wanted to hit him with my hammer, truthfully. 
His name was John. He cursed me from the moment I walked in the door that day all through the day until we walked out. And the next morning, we'd do it all over. Last day, I'm heading out. I'd kept my head down and my mouth shut. I didn't even talk about what I did. I'm going to Bible college. I just ignored him. I would have shared Jesus with anybody at that factory, but not John. And I walked out the door, and John came to me, and he says, you thought I was going to go easy on you. He was really terrible the last day. He thought I was, you thought I'd go easy on you today, didn't you? And I'm like, got my hammer. No, didn't expect anything out of you. And then John gets in front of me with big tears in his eyes. And he says, I'm going to miss you so much. I wish I could just go with you. And I am deeply ashamed today to say that I didn't share Jesus with him because I had this fear of whatever it was, this, this rotten guy being mean to me. If John was on the trajectory that he was on then, he's dead today. I regret that. I kept my head down and my mouth shut. He needed, and God was at work in him. God, something was working on his heart. And I, in my fear or whatever it was, I missed it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Be like the prophet. Take it in the shins if you have to. But blessed is your reward in heaven. If you get penalized or canceled or despised for sharing the truths of God. Reward. For opening your mouth and saying what you already believe to be true. Don't miss it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the prophet Jeremiah. Thank you for Wow, Lord, that he would share his heart, his hurt, his pain, his, his frustration, his loneliness as an example for us of what can happen, but the glory of actually sharing your good news is worth it, Lord, because you're great and the message is great. Forgive us, Lord, where we've missed the mark, where we've kept our mouths shut, our heads down and just avoided it out of fear, or cowardice, or whatever it is, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for that. Reinstate us like you did Jeremiah. Give us another option. Give us another opportunity. Help us to have that opportunity this week when the opportunity comes to us that we openly share, fearlessly share what we know to be truly the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. Grant us hearts of courage. Grant us the grace who like your son did despise the shame so we can do your will. Help us to that end, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Nick. Uh, we're going to close, if you'd stand with us, with Oh, Lord, You're Beautiful. As we were working on this song, these words kind of struck me anew. Oh, Lord, You're Beautiful, and Your face is all I seek. found myself asking, is His face all I seek? Second verse, O oh Lord, please light the fire that once burned bright and clear. If you're like me today, and sometimes you think maybe that light's not burning quite as bright as it did at one time, as we sing this song, let this be your prayer today.
God, just help us today as we go uh, to take your light out to a dying world, Lord. Help us to not be ashamed. Help us not to conform to the culture, but to be transformed and renewed by the renewing of our mind through your word. We pray that we would take this light out to the world and share the good news of Jesus Christ. In your name we pray.